So let's say you got a patient who was in the tech arrest, but you were able to get him back into a sinus rhythm. And now the guy has a pulse, but is comatose. So I'm going to assume he's intubated. So what we have here is a return of spontaneous circulation. And the new ACLS guidelines really want to stress post-resuscitative care. Now there are several goals we're going to want to do in post-resuscitative care. And they are to optimize blood pressure, let's say optimize breathing, treat any underlying ACS, and therapeutic hypothermia. So how are you going to optimize the blood pressure? Well, your goal is to keep the systolic blood pressure greater than 90, or you could say the MAP, mean arterial pressure, greater than 65. And you could do that a couple of different ways. You can use IV fluids or pressors. To optimize breathing, your goal is to keep the CO2 at a proper range. Remember, there's, there's two ways we can measure that. We can do the an arterial blood gas, so we can do the PaCO2, and you want to keep that between like 40 and 45 millimeters of mercury. And the other thing that we talked about before was to measure the end tidal CO2. And that we want to keep around 35 to 40. Treating ACS means you have to take them to the cath lab if needed. And finally, therapeutic hypothermia. We want to maximize their neurologic potential, meaning we don't want them to end up brain damaged afterwards. And so cooling them down decreases the brain's metabolic demands and has been shown to improve neurologic outcomes after resuscitation. So your goal here is to keep get them down to a temperature of like 32 to 34 degrees Celsius for about 12 to 24 hours. So this talk is going to be mostly about this, the therapeutic hypothermia. So who's a good candidate for therapeutic hypothermia? Well, first of all, they have to have a pulse, meaning that they've had return of spontaneous circulation after a code. And which rhythms have been shown to help? Namely, V-fib and V-tac, return of spontaneous circulation from there. There have been randomized controlled trials which show that therapeutic hypothermia is helpful. But even though there's no randomized controlled trials for it, asystole and PEA, it's recommended as well. The patient should probably be comatose too because you're going to be getting them pretty cold and that's not comfortable. So patients who do not wake up from a code. And ideally you'd like to have return of spontaneous circulation occur about less than 30 minutes from when either the paramedics brought the patient in or whether whenever the code team brought the patient down to the ER. So let's talk about how to do this. First let's make a graph with temperature being on one axis and time on another. So a normal temp is about 37 degrees Celsius. And remember our goal is to hit somewhere between 32 and 34. And so we're going to start after the return of spontaneous circulation here. And we're going to get our patient down to that goal temperature and keep them there for about 12 to 24 hours and then slowly bring them back up. And so this whole process is broken down into three phases. The first is called induction, then maintenance, and this last part is called rewarming. And all of this is going to take about 12 to 24 hours. And ideally we would want to get this to happen in the ER because the sooner you do it the better the outcomes are and also the faster you do it. So let's talk about induction then we'll talk a little bit about maintenance. So what do you need in order to induce therapeutic hypothermia? You need to cool the patient somehow. And there's really two ways that most people will do it. One is to put ice packs in the axilla and the groin and that works but it's not as good 
as giving the patient chilled IV fluids. And so basically you could keep a bunch of IV bags in the refrigerator. Refrigerator temperature is good enough. So you're going to give about 500 cc boluses uh, and then recheck the temperature of these chilled IV fluids. Now the studies actually say you want to give 30 mLs per kg and there are even formulas that go based on the patient's temperature. But this is a, a, probably a good estimate here, 30 mLs per kg or 500 cc. So you give a 500 cc bullets, you check the temperature and you say if you're within that range you want to be, if not you might have to give some more chilled IV fluids. Now remember we said we want to give it fast. So if you just let it drip in, it's going to go in, but not as fast as you want. So maybe we should put a pressure bag over this thing. And so a pressure bag is basically like a blood pressure cuff that goes around an IV bag and can get, get that fluid in fast. Because if, if you can get it in at 100 cc's per minute via the pressure bag, then you can consistently drop the temperature about 1 degree Celsius per 10 minutes. And if you remember, we wanted to go from 37 to about 34, so that's 1, 2, 3. So it's going to take us about 30 minutes to get there. 30, 40 minutes. 30 to 50 minutes. So how are you going to measure the temperature? Well, you could try an oral temperature, but that's not going to be very reflective of core temp. Even rectal temperature is not very good. There's two main ways that they recommend to measure temperature. The preferred way is an esophageal temperature probe. You can also do a bladder probe as long as the patient is still making urine. If they're not making urine, there's nothing flowing past there. And it's not accurate. The idea is you want to get as close a measurement of core temperature as possible. Because we want this brain to be cool and we want to guess how close we are to that. Actually, the ideal way to measure it would be to actually put in a pulmonary artery catheter and measure the temperature that way, but that's kind of labor-intensive and so might not be needed unless you're putting in the catheter anyway. So another thing worth mentioning is we want to keep the patient from warming himself up and a couple of things are going to do that. Shivering, agitation, uh, even the body's own hypothalamus. So you can give a couple of medications to stop that. A fentanyl drip might be useful for two reasons. Number one is to help sedate the patient because if they're awake and anxious, then their brain is going to be going crazy, increasing metabolic demand, and that's exactly what we're trying to prevent. We want the brain's metabolic demand to decrease, so we want to keep them sedated. You don't necessarily have to paralyze them. In fact, some would say don't. The other thing that fentanyl will do is it will prevent shivering. And finally, some will give some rectal Tylenol to blunt the hypothalamic response. So now, hopefully, we have given some cooled IV fluids or ice in the groin and axilla, and we've gotten the patient down to our goal temperature, which is 34 to 32. So now that we got them cool, we want to keep them cool. And the best device that's been found to do that are cooling blankets. So these are specially made blankets that one will go on top and one will go underneath the patient and they connect to a device which maintains the temperature. And there's a feedback from that esophageal probe that we put in before. That goes right into the device and makes sure that the temperature is kept between 32 and 34. And remember, this time we want to make sure that we keep them sedated and keep them from shivering for these next 12 to 24 hours. And finally, rewarming, well, that'll take place in the ICU outside of the ER, but usually consists of ceasing all cooling methods and letting the patient come back to a normal temperature. So now let's talk about some complications of therapeutic hypothermia. Patients can get coagulopathic. Cooling can also decrease immune function and so is not recommended in septic patients. It may raise the sugar, so you want to try to keep good control of sugar. Keep it less than 180. So let's do a quick review. We're going to talk about therapeutic hypothermia in the setting of the return of spontaneous circulation, so post-recessive care. What you had was a patient who was in V-fib or V-tac and now went back to a sinus rhythm. Even asystole or PEA apply 
even though there aren't any randomized controlled trials, they're still going to do it for these pe patients. They were pulseless, and now they've got a pulse, though they remain comatose, and maybe we can start this within 30 minutes. And our goal is to get these guys from a normal temperature down to somewhere between 32 and 34 for about a half to a full day, and then bring them back up. And the idea is we want to save the brain, decrease the metabolic demands of the brain in that time. And so the way we will do it is first we need to induce therapeutic hypothermia, and we're going to do that by chilled IV fluids with a pressure bag, giving 500 cc boluses at about 100 cc's per minute. And that would hopefully drop their temperature about 1 cc, sorry, about 1 degree Celsius every 10 minutes. We'll be measuring the temperature via an esophageal probe, and we need to keep these patients sedated. So fentanyl is great for that because it not only sedates them, it prevents shivering, which would be counterproductive for us. For maintenance, we're going to put them in on cooling blankets. And there's usually a machine that keeps the blankets cool and it gets feedback from the esophageal probe. Rewarming takes place about a day later. And I'll talk about the complications again. Patients can get coagulopathic. If so, keep them on the warmer side of that range, about 34. There can be some decreased immune function, so not necessarily a good thing to do for our septic patients. And watch their sugars. And that's it.